Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. And it is so nice to get to see all of you. Happy Easter. Who said that? June, thank you. It is Easter. Happy Easter to all of you. I'm so glad you're here. What a blessed opportunity that we have to get to come together to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The title of the message today is, What Are the Results? So I've got a funny story for you. Can you believe this? This is one of my favorites. I probably say that every time, don't I? Yeah. <laughs> After her preacher died and went to heaven, he noticed that a New York cab driver had been given a higher place than he had. I don't understand, he complained to St. Peter. I devoted my entire life to my congregation. Our policy is to reward results, ex explained St. Peter. Now, what happened, Reverend, when you gave a sermon? The minister admitted that some in the congregation fell asleep. I'm glad none of you fall asleep when I'm preaching. Thank you for that, by the way. Exactly, said St. Peter, and... When people rode in this man's taxi, not only did they stay awake, but they prayed. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. We are the kind of people who want and demand results. We want results. When we buy a new washing machine, we expect it to work. The result of our buying something new is that it works. When we take and get our car fixed, when we get it back, we expect it to work. Why? Because we want and expect results. We start a new diet plan or exercise plan. We get all frustrated when we don't fit into an old dress after two days. You know why? Because we expect results. We want results. Today is Easter. Today is the day that Jesus rose up from the grave. Do you suppose there were any results that happened as a result of the resurrection? What are the results? Does the Bible tell us what happens as a result of the resurrection? So today God wants you to see the results of the resurrection. Now I'm going to give you three of them. That's what the message is going to be today. Three results of the resurrection. And as I go through all this, what I want you to do to not only pay attention to what I'm saying, thank hopefully anyway, right? At least some of you, most, if most of you did, that'd be great. I'd take that. But I want you to think about, I'm only going to give you three. Are there four? Are there five results of the resurrection? In other words, are there more than three? If there's more than three as you leave today, I want you to tell me what's another result. What one did I miss? You can be my pastor today and tell me a result of the resurrection that I'm not going to give you here this morning. Unless you think there are only these three. So three, three results of the resurrection. First result... We have peace with God. We have peace with God. Number two, second result. We have power in life. And number three, we have promotion to heaven. So three results of the resurrection. First one. We have peace with God. Let me tell you something. So I, so I started looking at some numbers. Have you guys ever looked up anxiety numbers in the United States? I could probably take a poll just of you guys sitting here this morning. And you don't have to do this. If I said raise your hand if you've ever experienced or dealt with anxiety. I bet you almost all of your hands would go up. What do you think? Probably a safe bet. Maybe not all. Some of you are probably superhuman somehow. 
But I suspect that most of us in here have dealt with anxiety or depression or some of its various forms in one way, shape, or form or another. Now, some of the most common things that I think about when I think about like anxiety is, oh, dearly beloved, my taxes are due. And I get all worked up about dealing with my taxes. And so I get anxiety. Or uh, maybe it's something that you did. Maybe at work the other day, you punched somebody in the face. Did I get your attention? Is this thing on? You punched somebody in the face at work the other day. And tomorrow when you go into work, uh, Jeff, to the office, please, Jeff. <laughs> What's going to happen with his heart at that point? Ba -ba -boom, ba -ba -boom, ba -ba -boom, ba -ba Why? Because he did something wrong. He knows it. And he's about to get chewed out. <laughs> what do you think you're doing? We got you on cameras and everything, buddy. Sometimes that's why we have anxiety. But there's a million different reasons to have anxiety. But let me suggest to you that perhaps one reason that we as people have anxiety is because apart from God, apart from God, his goodness, his grace, his mercy, apart from who God is, apart from God, did you know that we are enemies of him? This isn't a neutral thing that we have with God. We are an enemy of his. It's not just a grandfather in the sky, somebody that I can talk to, or the man upstairs. Some of us like to kind of like downplay this somehow. You're an enemy of God if you do not have fellowship with him. And I wonder, I'm just going to throw this out there. Is some of the reason why some of us have so much anxiety is because we don't have a right relationship with God? And we know that we're going to stand before him one day. I tell you what, you think it's bad to get called up to the office because you did something stupid at work yesterday? You just wait until you get your number called and you have to meet God in his office. I tell people all the time at work when I see them doing something really dumb, I say, let me tell you something, guys. We can handle this one of two ways. Either you and I, just me, I'm a nobody, okay? You and I can take care of whatever you just did. We can sweep it under the rug. We can deal with it somehow. We can get it figured out. We'll sift it out, sort it out somehow, but just between you and me, and we'll just get it done right now. Or you can talk to the big boss when he comes in tomorrow morning. You know, every time they tell me they want to just take care of it right now. Can you believe that? I'm telling you right now. You have a sin problem in your life. It has alienated you from God. So that you are now an enemy of his. Not just a bystander, but an enemy of his. And you're in his crosshairs. <laughs> And one day he's going to call you up into his office and you're going to have to deal with him. But I'm going to tell you right now, how about you and I? How about you and I take care of that sin problem that you have before you get called up into his office? And I wonder if some of the anxiety that some of us face sometimes is because we understand that this is true. We understand that there's a power greater out there than anything we've ever known or understood. And his name is God. And he's going to call into account the things that you've done in this life. And he's going to hold you accountable for the sins that you've committed in this life. All the wicked and wrong and bad things that you've done. He's going to hold you accountable. <clears throat> but I'm going to tell you right now, before you get called up into his office, how about you and I just take care of this stuff? How about you and I just handle this right now? Jesus died for your sins. All those bad, wrong, and wicked things that you've done and have been doing your whole life, Jesus died so that you could be forgiven. And to demonstrate that his payment was sufficient for your sins so that you could be forgiven was God rose him from the dead. 
And he is now able to satisfy your sin debt. And until you ask God to forgive you of what you've done wrong, you're an enemy of his. You do not have peace with him. But as a result of the resurrection, you can have peace with God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How can you have peace with God? You have to be reconciled to God through Jesus. And if you do not have that kind of relationship with him, then you are not at peace. And I wonder if that's where some of the anxiety in our world comes from. We've come so far away from God. Some of you are old enough to remember the Bible being in schools and prayer being in schools. We've fallen hard as a society. We've really strayed. And I'm wondering if as a result there is a lack of peace. The resurrection provides peace for us because God has shown to us that he will accept the payment of Christ on your behalf for your sins. Have you accepted that in your life? Because once you have Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, if you'll go there, we're going to do a lot of flipping today. I should be doing some Bible drills with you guys, some sword drills. You guys ever done sword drills before? Who can get there first, reads it, that kind of thing? All of a sudden, the books go down. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing except taxes. You can be anxious about that one, right? No, I'm kidding. The Bible doesn't say that, actually. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Do you have this peace of God in your life? Jesus tells us in John chapter 16 and verse 33, you want to go there. John chapter 16, the upper room discourse. We're getting right to the end of the life of Jesus in this, in this passage here. John chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus tells us this. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Are you lacking peace? Do you find that you lack peace as you go throughout your day? You just don't have peace? Do you find that you're restless? One of the results of the resurrection is that you can have peace with God. And sometimes I wonder if some of the reason that we don't have peace with God is because we think that we've got this God thing figured out and handled, when in fact, you don't. So let this day be a day where you genuinely do some introspection. Let this be a day where you genuinely ask yourself the the really hard questions. Do I genuinely know Jesus as my Savior? Have I genuinely repented of my sins? Or does my life still bear the bad and wrong fruit of unrepentance? Let this be a day where you genuinely decide whether or not have I committed myself. And you know what? If you have never accepted Jesus as your Savior, if you've never gotten down on your knees, if you've never begged him to forgive you of your sins, if you've never by faith accepted the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, let this day be the day where you do that. And don't let it go on another day further. I was talking to a friend the other day. We were talking about this very topic. And I said, I want you to imagine that I, that I hurt you in a really bad way. Okay. I said, how would you know if we were okay? Because obviously if I've hurt you in a bad way, we're probably not okay. Well, yeah, duh. How would you know when we were okay? Would you just go home and would you just write it down on a piece of paper? Well, no. 
How would you know that we're okay? I would have to come to you and apologize to you and tell you that I was sorry. This is the same thing we have to do with God. You have to go to God and tell him that you're sorry. You can't just kind of hope for the best or, I don't know, go to church enough times or, I don't know. Some people like to bank on and, and use all kinds of things as an excuse for why they should be okay with God. But your baptism, your giving, your church attendance, your this, your that, and a million other things don't cut it. If I hurt you in a really bad way and bought you flowers, that doesn't fix anything. I could hurt you in a really bad way and buy you some chocolates. Ladies, does that fix anything? No, thank you, Kaylee. Pam, <laughs> chocolates are nice, I understand that. But it doesn't fix anything. What does fix it? An apology. A sincere, legitimate apology. Not one where I'm blaming you. Well, if it wasn't for you, I would have never kicked you anyway, so sorry. <laughs> Ladies, does that cut it for an apology? No. That's not how you apologize to God either then, by the way. But we can have peace with God. When we humbly accept him as our savior, we can have that peace in our God. And after you do that, once you've accepted Jesus Christ as your savior and that peace of God comes into your life, comes into your heart and it starts to rule you, you also have now power in life. Second Timothy chapter one. It's all the way, well, not quite all the way in the back, but a little further back than we're probably used to. 2 Timothy is after 1 Timothy. Thank you. Joke. Is this, this thing on? 2 Timothy is after 1 Timothy. Whew. I still got most of you. Okay, so I'm doing good. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. When you are saved, and that's what the Bible calls it, when you accept Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says that you are saved. Of course, you have to ask yourself, so then saved from what? Saved from an eternity in hell, saved from the punishment of hell, saved from the damnation of hell. You, are, you have been rescued from that. And when that happens to you, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit enters into you, you're given the Spirit, and that Spirit gives us power for life and for living. That Spirit allows us to have confidence in life. That Spirit allows us to do things we wouldn't otherwise normally do. You'll notice as you read through the book of Acts, you'll see these, you'll see these guys, Peter, James, John, some of these other cats, who before were fishermen. They were unlearned, uneducated. But when they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, they have now power for life and for living. And they're now doing things they would have probably never thought they'd have done before. They're out preaching Jesus. They're healing people. They're, Peter raises the dead. Paul raises the dead. They're healing people. They're doing all kinds of wonderful ministries and miraculous things. They now have power for life and for living. They don't, they don't need to be ashamed of who they are as believers in Jesus Christ. And did you know that that same spirit that empowered those first generation believers, those apostles of Jesus Christ, the same spirit that enabled them for service, enables you for service. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead is now alive and at work in you who believe. And some of us just show up for church on Sunday. I'm not sure that's a very good use of power. Can you imagine a house that has all of this wiring and stuff to it and all you do is just plug in a coffee maker? You've got enough power to light up a city block with this house and all you're doing is putting in a coffee maker? That seems a little, mm, not quite right. Did you know that we are so wired for power with the Holy Spirit given to us, we should be able to do about anything. 
we should be able to stand before kings because we can stand before the king of kings. And some of us don't even want to make a phone call to somebody. We have power for living. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, one of the best verses in the Bible, right, June? (laughs) You should know what this verse is. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord. Uh Uh-huh, right? Yeah. 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 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. As you go throughout your life, as you're sharing the name of Jesus, as you're trying to be a strong witness for him, as you're trying to do the right thing, did you know that there are going to be times when the devil's going to want to knock you down? He's going to not want you to say the name of Jesus. He's going to want to take you out of the game. He's going to make your life miserable. He's going to perhaps ail you with some sort of sickness or something like that. Who knows what he's going to do with you as you try to serve the living God. And the Bible gives us this this warning that we need to be strong in the Lord. We shouldn't be trying to go around in our own strength trying to serve him because it's not going to work. We need to be strong in the Lord and the Spirit gives us that power so that we can serve him, so that we can make better choices. You know why Jesus hung on the cross? For our sins. Do you know why repentance is so necessary? It's because those sins that we committed put him up there. It was my sin that put him up there. It was your sin that put Jesus on that cross. I'd like him to come down. I don't think he deserves to be up there. I want my Jesus ruling and reigning. I want him to be powerful. I want him to be holy creator God. He doesn't deserve to be up there. But you know why he's up there? It's because of sins. He doesn't want you to be sinning anymore. You need to stop it. You know, like when you're training a dog and you got a little spray bottle and he pees on the floor and you get your spray bottle out and you spray the dog and you say, stop it and don't do that anymore. Sometimes I wonder if there's some people out there I need to follow along with a spray bottle. They're doing some really stupid sins. I need to spray them and say, hey, you need to stop it. Stop your sinning. Stop doing this stupid stuff. This is why Jesus is on the cross, fellow. Knock it off. Talking to myself, though, aren't I? Do you not realize that you have power to stop that? Do you not understand that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and gives you everything you need for life and living so that you can stop your sinning. Some of us have very easy triggers and traps that we fall into routinely and regularly. Stop it. Knock it off. You have power for life. Act like it. Knock it off. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. It's in here somewhere. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Jesus is talking to the disciples. He's not quite ascended yet. They're asking him what's going on. Before he ascends into heaven in verse 8 of Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells the disciples this. But you shall receive... Power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The Spirit gives us power for life and living, for righteousness sake, for making better choices in life. How are you doing with that? Another result of the resurrection. Not only do we have peace with God, you have power for life and for living so that you can make better choices. Finally, we have promotion to heaven. 
Amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. How about this one, huh? We have promotion to heaven, the third result of the resurrection. Not only peace with God, power in life, but promotion to heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. Second Corinthians chapter five and verse eight. Paul tells the Corinthians this. We are confident, yes, well, please rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If you know Jesus Christ as your savior, if you have confessed your sins, you've repented of your sins, you've accepted by faith the death of Jesus for you. You've called on the name of the Lord for salvation. Not only can you have peace with God, but power in life, but you will be promoted to heaven one day. When you die, you will be absent from this body and you will be present with the Lord. How many of you are looking forward to that day? Uh-huh. There we go. That's what it's all about, isn't it? I can't wait for that day too. But what happens if you die and you don't know Jesus as your Savior? Oh, oh, we weren't, oh, well, hello. Weren't expecting that one, were you? As a believer, when you die, you are present with the Lord. Because it is appointed for man to die once, and then the judgment, according to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. But what happens if when you die, you're not a believer, now what? What I affectionately call the trap door. And you go to hell. Why? Because you have a sin debt that needs to be paid. And if you're going to pay your own sin debt, I guess you can make that choice. But if you have to pay for your own sin debt, the punishment for that is hell. For all of eternity. For all of time. For all of eternity. And that's where you're going to be. And that's where you're going to stay. And that's the bottom line. I hope none of you want to do that. I hope none of you are interested in this. But there are some people out there that have no problem with that. They want to say things like, oh, I've got friends that are going to be down in hell. I can't wait to go party with them. It's just going to be a big old party down there. I can't wait. There's no such thing anyway. That's baloney. Don't listen to these people. They have no clue about what's going on. They don't understand the power that exists on the other side. We need to be ready for whenever our number is going to be called. You do not know the time, the hour, or the day that your number is going to be called and you're going to be gone from this earth. You do not know when it's going to be. It could be on the way home today. It could be this afternoon. It could be next week. It could be next year. You do not know when your number is going to be called. You need to be ready today, right now. You could die of a heart attack right now, for all I know. We've all known people that have just dropped dead just for no reason. Just all of a sudden, they're dead. You don't think that could happen to you? You don't think that could happen to me? That could happen to any one of us at any time. This life is so fragile. If I've learned nothing over the last probably year or so of my life, it is how fragile life is. And when God calls your number, there's nothing you're going to do about it. It's over. You had better be ready. You need to be living your life in such a way that there is no doubt to any one of us that you are a genuine believer in Jesus Christ. You've been born again, that this is real. One of the other favorite things that I've learned over the course of time and studying is something I saw on Facebook, Amy brought to my attention one day, is the thief on the cross. I was talking to somebody the other day about entrance into heaven and how does somebody go to heaven? 
we weren't necessarily talking about this per se, but we were talking about heaven and how do you get there. And this person was telling me about their baptism and how they were baptized. I think there were six, let's say. It doesn't really matter. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Tell me about the thief on the cross then. Remember, when Jesus died, there were three of them. Jesus was in the middle, and then there's two thieves on either side. You remember that? And Jesus says to the one in Luke chapter 22 and verse 43... He says, what to the one thief? Today, how many of you have this memorized? Today, you will be with me in paradise. Okay, hold on just a second. Boy, this ought to blow your mind. For everybody that's ever been out there, that's ever told me that they got saved because they got baptized or something like this, explain to me the thief on the cross. That poor soul wasn't baptized. He'd never been to church. For all we know, never gave a dime of money. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. That just flies in the face of everything we think and believe in modern American Christianity, doesn't it? Because we think, you know how many people I ask on a weekly basis, tell me when you came to know the Lord. That's my favorite question. Tell me when you came to know the Lord. Number one, if we were playing the feud, how many of you like to play the feud with Steve Harvey? Okay, I love the feud with Steve Harvey. He is hilarious. Number one answer, when I ask people, I'll ask 100 people, when did you come to know the Lord? Number one answer has something to do with baptism. The word baptism will come up in their answer. Explain to me the thief on the cross. I'll wait. He was not baptized, ladies and gentlemen. And if he doesn't need to be baptized, neither do you. I don't want to hear about your baptism. Not in terms of salvation, anyway. Okay, just so we're all clear. We have promotion in heaven, not because of our baptism. We have promotion in heaven, not because of our church attendance. We have promotion to heaven, not because of a million other things. To believe that there's something that you could do, for example, baptism, for example, giving money, for example, this, that, and a million other things, is to suggest that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross was insufficient to pay for your sins. In other words, he got it close. He was real close. When he died on the cross, oh, that was so close to pay for your sins. All you need to do is get baptized to finish it off. I don't think so. I don't think so. Jesus said on the cross his last words. You remember what they were? It is finished. In other words, no baptism necessary. In other words, no church attendance necessary. No giving necessary. No nothing necessary. Why? Because it is finished. Three days later, he rose from the grave and demonstrated that God does accept it. God is well pleased. That payment is paid in full. All you now have to do is believe. Accept it. Repent of your sins that put them up there in the first place, would you? Stop living your life like an unbeliever. Start living your life like somebody who actually believes that he died for you. Start living your life in a way that honors and glorifies God in the first place. Start living your life by making decisions that are wise and well-pleasing to the Father. Stop worrying about what everybody else wants you to do. What your friends are doing. Stop worrying about a million other things and start, let's start worrying about what God wants you to do. What does God want you to do? Because at the end, he's going to promote you to heaven. Well, that's quite the promotion. You know, I just got a promotion at work. 
Thank you for the round of applause, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, you know, when you get a promotion at work, I don't know about you, but I work a little harder. You get a pay raise, you get a new name badge, you know. It's a big deal to get a promotion at work. I don't know about you, but it makes me work a little harder. You know, if this little promotion at Fairway makes me work a little harder, how much harder should you work if God is going to promote you to heaven? That should be way harder. And you know what? By and large, as I look out into Christianity, not you guys because you guys are wonderful, but as I look out into Christianity in America today, as we think about the promotion to heaven, I don't see the lots that you mentioned, June. I don't. Do you? Are you seeing something that I'm not seeing in Christianity today in America? You are being promoted to heaven. The amount of effort and work that you should be putting into your Christianity should be oh, just astounding. Do you see that in modern America Christianity? I don't. Am I missing something? Why are we as people so negligent, so, so bad? Why are we so off base with our efforts to be well-pleasing in that holy and living sacrifice that Romans talks about? Why are we so off base with our Christianity? We just enjoy I don't know, maybe we just want to just microwave our Christianity on Sunday mornings and hope we still have a nice pipe and hot meal Saturday night for when we commune with the Lord. If you've ever microwaved food, you know that it doesn't last long and it's cold. I want your Christianity to be just as piping hot Saturday night as it is noon on Sunday. Do you want that for you? I want that for you. I work really hard on my end to try to make that as piping hot as I can for you. Do you work as hard for you as some other people work as hard for you to keep your Christianity vibrant, alive, active, and not just a passive thing that we do just to pass an hour away Sunday morning? You were given a promotion to heaven. What more? Do you, do you need more from God to do more for him? Like, what is this going to take? Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 tells us that our citizenship is in heaven. He says this, our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the word eagerly are you eagerly awaiting the return of Jesus <coughs> same Jesus that went up will in like manner come back down the angels told the disciples and if you had to give me a fourth maybe it's that as a result of the resurrection he's coming back Are you ready for that? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you repented of your sins? Have you asked him to forgive you? One of my favorite illustrations about accepting salvation and how this works is, let's say I had a check here. You were going to buy a car for $10,000. And I have a check written. Who can I pick on here? Who can I pick on? Nobody? Nobody? Julie, thank you. Thank you. Julie, I'm going to, she wants to buy a car. It's $10,000. So Julie, you bought $10,000. Is her car paid for? I've got a check right here with her name on it. $10,000. And that'll fully pay for the car. On the road right now, $10,000. I got a check right here with her name on it. Could she buy this car? Mm. You, accept the check. you got, oh, Vicky, what did you say? Said if you accept 
you got to accept the check. Julie, you got to come up here and get it. Check. I don't really. <laughs> you know, it would be a really fun twist if I had $10,000 for everybody. That would have been quite the twist, but no. No, I work at Fairway, so <laughs> it's not going to happen. However, Jesus has a check with your name on it. Sin debt, paid in full. He's got it in his hand for every one of you. He actually does have this for every one of you. Sin debt, paid in full. Right up here. He's, he's got it in his hand. Is your sin debt paid for? you got to accept the check. Jesus is standing right behind me, apparently. He's got his check in his hand. He's got your name on it. Are you going to come up here and are you going to collect on the check? You will not have peace with God. You do not have power in life and you will not receive a promotion to heaven unless and until you receive that check. Have you accepted Jesus? If you haven't, let this be the day of your salvation. Let's pray.